Regular meeting number eight will now come to order. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem. This evening, Council was pleased to have uh, Pastor Julius Lancaster to pray with us. Pastor, welcome to Council. Pastor Lancaster is lead pastor at I Am Church. Pleasure to be here, all council members, elected officials, all heads bowed. Gracious Father, we thank you for just this opportunity um, to be here. We thank you for allowing us to gather to discuss things pertaining to a greater city. We ask for clarity. We ask for excellence and deficiency, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Clerk, please call the roll. Ron Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Thank you, Madam Clerk. This week's communications received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications? Not at this time. Thank you, Madam right. Clerk. Are there resolutions by members of council, starting with President Pro Tem? Council Member Brown? Council Member Dorrance. Thank you, President Harden. No resolutions, but did want to make a couple announcements. I uh, wanted to announce my community hours for the month of February. Uh, I'll be at the Parsons branch of the Columbus Metropolitan Library located at 1113 Parsons Avenue on Wednesday, February 19th from 11.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. We'll be having pizza from Plank's Cafe, uh, Plank's Cafe and Pizzeria, also known as Plank's on Parsons, unlike Plank's on High. Uh, Slicer Limited, so first come, first serve. Look, looking forward to a chat with folks um, who come out on Wednesday. What's that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, only so much pizza to go around. Um, secondly, I also wanted to announce uh, our council family grew by one this past mm. weekend. Uh, Kevin McCain from my staff and his, his wife Sarah welcomed their daughter Grace Mitchell McCain on Saturday at 2.26 a.m. And um, mom and little, little Grace are both doing well. So just wanted to let folks know that we've uh, got another baby around council. So that's all I have this evening. That's awesome. Councilmember Favor. Councilmember Remy. So, um, the recipient isn't here this evening, but I will uh, gladly read into um, the record the ordinance tonight. I uh, wanted to um, actually recognize and celebrate Friday, February 14, 2020, as Ohio Loves Transit Day in the city of Columbus. Um, we, we had asked uh, someone from CODA to be down here this evening, but um, I'll go ahead and read it and ask for your approval. And so the Ohio Public Transit Association recognizes outstanding public transportation on the third annual Ohio Loves Transit Day taking place on the 14th of February. In Columbus, Ohio, residents have relied on this Central Ohio Transit Authority millions of times to arrive safely at their home, 
um, work, school, and innumerable other destinations. 58% of downtown companies participate in the CPAS program with 15,167 memberships and 1,242,586 rides in 2019. CODA directly employs 1,200 Ohioans, including 728 transit operators, and supports thousands of additional jobs through their work. 3,043 stops along 42 routes operated by CODA help connect Columbus residents to one another while reducing wear on public roads, levels of traffic, and most, in, in some cases, most importantly, the carbon emissions that are, are uh, <laughs> that are taken away from not having single occupancy vehicles. CODA's deployment of 179 compressed natural gas buses protects Ohio's air, water, and environmental future while also supporting Columbus as a growing green city. The outstanding work done by Central Ohio Transit Authority, and here she comes, she made it, see, thanks. We're just reading through the ordinance, so I'm glad that you are here to receive it, and certainly we'll look forward to your comments. The outstanding work done by the Central Ohio Transit Authority since 1974 in providing Central Ohioans with affordable and reliable transportation is deserving of recognition. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the City of Columbus that this council does hereby recognize and celebrate Thursday, February 14th, 2020 as Ohio Loves Transit Day in the city of Columbus. Mallory, perfect timing. This is Mallory Donaldson, Community Relations Manager. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for your patience, too. I apologize for rushing in this way. Um, just wanted to address council and express our thanks um, for your continued support and commitment to truly moving every life forward here in um, Columbus, but also just the region in general. So thank you guys so much for taking your time today to acknowledge Ohio Loves Transit Week. Um, and I just look forward to continuing to work as we truly make a, a mark to, again, make every life here in the central Ohio region just more um, prosperous. So thank you. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Mallory. I appreciate it. Do any of my colleagues have any uh, comments this evening? President Harden. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Remy, and thank you, uh, Ms. Allenson, for coming down. Transit is critically important. Uh, I say that often that um, the biggest, uh, that, that our community's growth will be bring our biggest challenges, but also our biggest opportunity. Uh, and there will be no way that we can add 500,000 to a million people to our community without making real investments in transit to move people and connect people to the important things, jobs, to health care, to, ch to child care, to all those things that make a prosperous community. And so uh, I appreciate you uh, bringing the focus to transit and really mass transit. It's about moving the most amount of people the most efficiently. And we appreciate our partners at CODA our partners at MORPSI, our, certainly our public service department, um, our Department of Development, all the folks that stack hands to um, move this conversation along. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Passed. I've adopted. I would just like to announce my next community hours, which will be on Tuesday, February 18th at Stoff's Coffee Roasters, 627 South 3rd Street in Columbus. From 3.30 to 5, um, there will be coffee, plenty of coffee. Uh, that's all I have this evening. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Councilman Remy. Councilmember Tyson. All right. Uh, City Attorney's Office, uh, Madam Auditors, City Treasurer. All right. Are there any uh, requests by members of council for the approval of an ordinance resolution, uh, removal of the of resolution from the consent portion of the agenda? Seeing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of titles of 30-day legislation? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. Will the clerk now read into the record the ordinance numbers of 30-day legislation on tonight's agenda for first reading? 
Finance Committee Ordinances 279, 324, 334, and 346-2020. 2020 Recreation and Parks Committee Ordinance 50-2020. Public Utilities Committee Ordinances 127, 214, and 233-2020. Public Service and Transportation Committee Ordinances 299 and 323-2020. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, there's no speakers on the first agenda. The following ordinance appear on our agenda as consent actions. Will the clerk now read those ordinance numbers into the record? Resolution of Expression 38X-2020 <coughs> Finance Committee, Ordinances 36, 213, 244, 250, 267, 270, 310, 313, 316, 317, 348-2020 20. Recreation and Parks Committee, Ordinances 46, 47, 48, 65, and 306 2020. Public Safety Committee, Ordinance 196 2020. Public Utilities Committee, Ordinances 131, 170, 185, 203 2020. Technology Committee, Ordinance 124 2020. Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinances 113, 134, 226, 261, 268, 287, 297 2020. Housing Committee, Ordinance 220. 281, 318, 337, 339 2020. Administration Committee, Ordinances 68 and 266 2020. Health and Human Services Committee, Ordinances 67, 230, 231, 235 2020. And appointments from the Mayor's Office numbered A0030 2020. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We have one speaker on the consent portion of the agenda, Mr. Nathaniel Wilkins. Mr. Wilkins, welcome back to Council. Mr. Wilkins is speaking on ordinance 0220. 1612 Arlington Avenue, Mr. Nathaniel George Wilkins, of a resident of the North Linden area. Um, I'm speaking in against the Ordinance number CA31-0220. That's in uh, housing with favor, Lehman, endurance, and Hardy. I'm against this for several reasons. I mean, I know there's multiple times we talk about demolition of nuisance abatement property. Um, I'm really concerned about the cost. I know quite some time ago we looked at massive demolition all through the state of Ohio. So uh, again, I'm just kind of against this because I need to know the, the records, the time costly of these houses have been torn down in certain parts of the neighborhood, such as North Linden, South Linden, Malagrogan, and out west. So thank you for your time again. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wilkins. Uh, Director, do you have uh, any context for 0220? Yeah, yes, thank you, President Hardin, members of council. Uh, these are five properties that have become a public nuisance. Uh, they are all uh, west side, closer to the hilltop. Um, we had to demolish them already. They've mm -hmm. been demolished, so this ordinance then uh, places the assessment on the property owner so they can, we can be reimbursed for our costs. Thank you, Director. Are there any questions, further questions for the Director? Seeing uh, no further questions, may I have a motion for approval of these items designated as consent actions? Yes. Clerk, please call the roll uh, by voice. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Favor? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Ms. Tyson? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Uh, with the exception of 0230, uh, which I am abstaining. Consent portion of the agenda uh, carries. We will now proceed with the second reading of 30 day tabled in emergency legislation. The first committee to come before council is the Finance Committee. That committee is chaired by President Pro Tem. President Pro Tem, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Hardin. <clears throat> Tonight in finance, we are considering three ordinances uh, that represent final passage of the 2020 operating budget. Uh, as council reviewed the budget proposal put forward by the mayor, our goal was to create a process that was open, inclusive, and responsive to the needs of our diverse community. I want to thank Mayor Ginther and each and every city department for their work putting forward a budget that is balanced, 
fiscally sound, and continues vital services for Columbus residents and neighborhoods. I especially want to thank Director Lombardi and his team. Is there anything you would like to add, Director Lombardi? Sure. Uh, thank you, President Hardin, President Pro Tem Brown, other members of councils. I'll be brief. I want to thank as well uh, the mayor for his vision and his leadership throughout this process. I also want to thank my colleagues and their staff, and especially my staff who work long hours, make last minute changes, and crunch all the numbers for uh, everyone to be able to put this budget together. As you indicated, this is a balanced budget that reflects the priorities of the city. Um, it also invests in the future as we all recognize that there may be some economic changes that are unforeseen at this time. And I, want, I do appreciate the fact that council and the administration both look forward to the future by investing in our rainy day fund and our basic city services fund for those economic downturns. And again, thank you for everything you do as a finance committee chair. Thank you so much, Director. Um, since the budget was proposed last November, Council ha held nine hearings, many outside of City Hall, to review and receive public feedback. We also engage in outreach with residents across the city throughout the year. So I want to thank Erin Gibbons and the whole community engagement team for their efforts, which amounted to 93 community meetings and neighborhood hearings and more than 517 hours of conversation. Mm -hmm. That's incredible work by our community engagement team. As a body, council leveraged feedback from our hearing process and from each member's year-long community engagement to establish our collective priorities for the 2020 operating budget. Building pathways out of poverty, good paying jobs, and strong neighborhoods. Last Monday, council introduced 5.328 million in amendments across multiple areas to enhance the budget and further align spending priorities with the needs of our growing city. I wanna thank my colleagues for improving the budget through their work and amendments. Uh, as Director Lombardi stated, Council also made sure to allocate 500,000 additional dollars into the Rainy Day Fund for a total deposit of $3 million. That will result in a 2020 year-end balance of approximately $85 million, with a goal to achieve $90 million by the end of 2024. As Director Lombardi stated, planning is essential um, for any city, but especially for a growing city like ours, as residents' needs um, continue uh, to drive the growth of this budget. That Columbus is growing is a fact. Ensuring that it grows equitably is a future we must fight for. I am proud that the budget we are considering tonight aligns spending priorities with the needs of a growing city. Are there any additional comments from my colleagues before I move into reading the three budget ordinances? Uh, first, we have Ordinance 2925-2019 to make appropriations for the 12 months ending December 31st, 2020 for each of the several object classes for which the City of Columbus has to provide from the monies known to be in the Treasury of said City of Columbus in the fund known as the General Fund during the said 12 months from the collection of all taxes and from other sources of revenue, the amount of $965 million and to declare an emergency. I first request to remove this ordinance from the table. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Move from the table. I move for passage. Second. <laughs> Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Next is Ordinance 2926-2019 to make appropriations and transfers for the 12 months ending December 31st, 2020 for other funds for various divisions to authorize the city auditor to make transfers as may be necessary and to declare an emergency. I first request to remove from the table. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Remove from the table. And I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Finally, Ordinance 2927-2019 to make appropriations for the 12 months ending December 31st, 2020 for selected other funds for various divisions to authorize the city auditor to make transfers as may be necessary and to declare an emergency. I first request to move from the table. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Removed. And I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. That's all I have in my committees, Council President. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your leadership uh, through this process. Uh, the next committee to come before council is the sorry, 
This is a public safety committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Mitch Brown. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Uh, this evening, uh, I have 0195-2020 to authorize the Director of Public Safety to enter into a contract with Cronus, Inc. for the Division of Fire for the subscription software maintenance support for telestaff automated staffing software and web staff services to waive competitive bidding requirements of the Columbus City Codes to authorize the expenditure of $126,168.84 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. Uh, Director Pettis, can you share the reasoning for waiving of competitive bidding, sir? Council. Got it. Council <laughs> President Hardin, uh, Safety Chair Brown, members of Council, uh, the Department of Public Safety, Division of Fire, purchased the Telestaff automated staffing software and web staff services in 2006 via Ordinance 1057-2006. In 2009, upon complete integration of the system, the Division of Fire entered into a maintenance contract, including the option to renew for four additional one-year terms. Given the fact that Kronos Telestaff software is a proprietary PC-based software solution, designed specifically to assist the fire division in managing its complex staffing assignments, this ordinance authorizes the continued subscription to Kronos proprietary software service through February 2022. The proprietary nature of Kronos Telestaff software technology and the cost of conversion to a different system requires this subscription software service contract be purchased from the sole source provider, Kronos Inc. Therefore, the department requests to waive competitive bidding. Uh, this company is not debarred according to the federal excluded parties listing from being awarded a contract according to the Auditor of State Unresolved Findings for Recovery Certified Search. If there are no questions from my colleagues, I move for passage. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you, Director. That's all I have this evening, sir. Thank you, Chair. The next committee to come before Council is the Public Utilities Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Dorans. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Um, first, in Public Utilities, I have Ordinance 0052-2020 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter into an agreement for construction administration and inspection services with DLZ Ohio, Inc to authorize an expenditure of up to $852,364.30 from the Sanitary Sur General Obligation Bond Fund for the Allen Creek Trunk Rehabilitation Phase C project, to authorize an expenditure of up to $107,438.58 from the Sanitary Sur General Obligation Bond Fund for the West Franklinton Sewer Improvement Project, to authorize an expenditure of up to $50,000 for the Sanitary Sewer General Construction Administration and Inspection Project, to authorize an expenditure of up to $167,224.62 from the Storm Sewer Bond Fund for the Central Avenue Underpass Storm Stormwater Systems Improvement Project, to authorize a transfer of $45,362.30 within an, an expenditure of up to $50,000 from the Water General Obligation Bond Fund, for the General Construction CA slash CI project and to authorize an amendment to the 2019 Capital Improvement Budget. Uh, this contract is for construction administration and inspection services for sewers, water mains, storage tanks, and transmission and distri distribution power systems. This work will ensure the department's construction projects are done correctly and will last the anticipated service life. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Passed. Next, I have ordinance number 0141-2020 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to enter in a construction contract with Complete Journal Construction Company for the West Franklinton Sewer Improvement CIP 650870-116161 and Central Avenue Underpass Storm Sewer Improvements CIP 611033-10000 to authorize the appropriation and transfer of up to $1,082,925.54 from the Storm Sewer Reserve Fund to the Ohio Water Development Storm, Storm Water Loan Fund 
to authorize the appropriation transfer of up to $699,910.80 from the Sanitary Sewer Reserve Fund to the Ohio Water Development Sanitary, Sanitary Loan Fund to authorize the appropriation of the expenditure of up to $1,082,925.54 from the Ohio Water Development Storm Sewer Loan Fund to authorize the appropriation of, of expenditure of $699,910.80 from the Ohio Water Development Sanitary Sewer Loan Fund to authorize the transfer within and an expenditure of up to $1,000 for pervading wage services from the Sanitary General Obligation Voted Bond Fund and to authorize an expenditure of up to $1,000 for pervailing wage services within the storm sewer bond fund and to amend the 2019 capital improvement budget. Um, this project entails upgrades to the collection systems in the West Franklinton blueprint area and to the storm sewers to eliminate flooding issues and reduce sewer backups in basements. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Let's call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. Finally, I have ordinance number 0169-2020 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to modify and increase the contract for purchase of wholesale electric power and ancillary services within the American Municipal Power Inc. for the Division of Power and to authorize an expenditure of up to $9,210,000 from the Elect Electricity Operating Fund. Uh, this contract allows us to continue to serve uh, 14,000 residential and commercial customers within the City of Columbus. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Passed. Thank you, President Hart. That's all I have this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Next committee to come for council is the Public Service Committee. The committee is chaired by Councilmember Favor. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Tonight in excuse me, <clears throat> Public Service and Transportation, we have 0319-2020 to authorize the city attorney to file complaints in order to immediately appropriate and accept the remaining fee simple and lesser real estate necessary to timely complete the Shook Road Phase 2 project and to declare an emergency. The city's acquisition of the real estate will help make, improve, or repair certain portions of the pub public right-of-way of Shook Road, which will be open to the public without charge. Uh, do my colleagues have any questions or concerns? If not, I will move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. Next, we have uh, ordinance number 0320-2020 to authorize the city attorney to file complaints in order to immediately appropriate and accept the remaining fee simple and lesser real estate necessary to timely complete the intersection improvements Hilliard Rome Road at Federal Road Project and to declare an emergency. The city's acquisition of the real estate will help make, improve, or repair certain portions of the public right of way of Hilliard Rome Road which will be open to the public without charge. Do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'd move for passage. Mr. Second. <clears throat> Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Thank you, President Harden. May I move on to housing? Uh, in housing, we have ordinance number 0291-2020 to authorize the director of the Department of Development to make financial assistance available as grants to homeowners home buyers, renters for profit and nonprofit organizations to increase the local supply of decent, safe, and sanitary housing and decrease the number of vacant properties in our neighborhoods to authorize the expenditure of up to $2 million from the 2019 Housing Preservation Fund and to declare an emergency. This ordinance represents the annual appropriation for the Housing Preservation Fund. The funds will assist with grants for residential projects, including home repair, affordable and market rate housing. Uh, Eligible activities include renovation of existing vacant housing for residential purposes, redevelopment of vacant lots for residential purposes, and critical home repair for low and moderate income homeowners. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I'd call for a vo voice vote. Is there a second? Second. Please call the roll by voice. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Brown? Mr. Dorans? Yes. Ms. Faber? Yes. Mr. Remy? Yes. Ms. Tyson? President Harden? Yes, ordinance passed. Thank you. That's all I have in my committees. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next committee to come before council is the Economic Development Committee. 
That committee is chaired by Councilmember Remy. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, President Harden. Tonight I have an ordinance number 199-2020 to authorize the Director of Department of Development to enter into an enterprise zone agreement with 810 Grandview LLC for a tax abatement of 75% for a period of 10 consecutive years in consideration of a total proposed capital investment of approximately 19200000 and the creation of 20 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated annual payroll of approximately 832000 810 Grandview is proposing to invest a total project cost of approximately $19,200,000 in real property improvements to construct a new four-story speculative commercial office structure consisting of approximately 124,000 square feet on roughly 28.983 acres of undeveloped land located at 1400 City View Way, Columbus, Ohio, 43215. The company anticipates that the, the development of the proposed project will lead to the relocation of an unknown number of positions from within the city of Columbus and the creation of 20 net new full-time permanent positions with an estimated new annual payroll of approximately 832000 at the proposed project site. We do have one speaker on this uh, particular ordinance this evening. At this time, I'd like to call Joe Motiel up to uh, speak on this particular subject. Reminder, welcome back, Mr. Motil, and reminder, you state your name, and you have three minutes to, uh, to speak on this. President Harden, Pro Tem Brown, members of City Council, Joe Motil, live at 167 West Cook Road, Columbus, Ohio. Now that all the chosen ones were elected to Columbus School Board and Columbus City Council in November 19 election, the, after spending well over a million dollars to defeat five grassroots candidates to do so, the year 2020 appears to have already begun with the ongoing tax abatement policies that continue to deprive much needed revenue from our young, lower and middle income students who rely on a quality public education to escape the grasp of poverty. Last week, school board members once again showed their true colors by approving a tax abatement that will result in the loss of $19.7 million to Columbus school children over a 15-year period. And when this tax abatement request comes before city council for approval, it will no doubt be a slam dunk as well. And once again, this evening, as in past years, one of Columbus's leading tax abatement recipients and campaign contributors to the mayor and various city council members is here to ask for yet another pork chop. Combined campaign, combined Campaign, campaign contributions from this developer have been given to various council members and the mayor that have far exceeded the $100,000 mark since 2014. Wagenbrenner, or as they are now known as Thrive Companies, has received generous tax abatements in the Short North Italian Village, the Quarry Project, Harrison West, and Grandview Yards, all at the expense of our children's public education and higher property taxes that contribute to foreclosures and gentrification. So it would seem that the new Thrive name, the new name Thrive Companies is a perfect fit. The company thrives and prospers on receiving tax abatements while city hall politicians thrive on their campaign contributions. The Grandview Crossing project where this project is located is also receiving a tax abatement from Grandview Heights. The 29 acres of land being proposed tonight for a tax abatement is part of a larger new development that covers 53 acres of land. Its location is prime real estate that is situated in the backyard of one of Columbus's most affluent suburbs, Grandview Heights, and the newly developed Grandview Yards. The development, this development, is a two-mile drive to the Arena District in downtown Columbus from Dublin Road, and access to 670 and 315 is only blocks away. Once again, a risk-free development, and one that would take place regardless of developer tax abatements and a TIF arrangement from Grandview Heights. I also find it laughable that the city and developer refer to this 19 $2 million commercial building as speculative, especially when the city has noted on its own fact sheet for this tax abatement that, quote, the company anticipates that the development of the proposed project will lead to the relocation of an unknown number of positions from within the city of Columbus and the creation of 20 net full-time permanent job positions. I would like to ask the director if he could give an explanation on that as well when I'm through. When this $4.1 million tax abatement is approved, city council will have granted no less than $312,432,976 in tax abatements over the last four and a half years. I ask you please vote no on this and have somebody with the political courage to do so. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Motil. Um, Director, if you could speak to the, the overall ordinance, answer his question, and also about the brownfield remediation that took place on this piece of property or that was necessary to take place in order to develop. Thank you, Chair Remy, President Harden, members of council. Uh, development is pleased to move forward this uh, strategic investment uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, you mentioned that it is a brownfield redevelopment that uh, is a challenging site that has sat vacant for many years now. Uh, we're also pleased that we have more speculative office space being made available to our, um, to the market. What we're finding now and we work with our economic, uh, economic development partners is we have a significant lack of available Class A office space. So when we're out trying to recruit businesses from across the country, uh, we're losing our competitive edge because they're looking for space that is available now, not space that could be built in three years. So we are using this tool as a way to encourage that investment to have that development have occur now so we can continue to attract jobs and future investment into the city of Columbus. I'd be happy to answer any other questions. I do not see any other questions, so thank you for that uh, explanation. And could you, um, actually, I do have one question. Could you speak to what speculative is in case people don't understand that in the listening audience? Yeah, thank you, Chair Remy, President Hart, and members of council. One of the challenges we're facing in our commercial real estate market now is it is difficult for developers to uh, get loans at the local level to build a building uh, without it at least being 50% leased out. So having the resources to go ahead and build a new building uh, without signed leases and, and have something that is available uh, for those businesses that are either growing and expanding here in Columbus or looking to relocate to Columbus is a real um, asset to what we're trying to do in our economic development work. So speculative office building is you, you don't have a tenant, you're, you're taking the risk to build that building. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Arden. Passed. And that's all I have this evening in economic development. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The next committee to come before our council is the Health and, uh, Health and Human Services Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Tyson. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you. I have Ordinance 251-2020. is to authorize and direct the Board of Health to accept a grant from the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio for the 2020 Swaco Community Waste Reduction grant program in the amount of $5,554.86 to authorize the appropriation of $5,554.86 to the Health Department and the Depart Health Department's grants fund and to declare an emergency. Um, pursuant to its solid waste management plan, SWACO implements programs to increase solid waste reduction, reuse, and recycling within SWACO's district and awards funding to various organizations to implement such programs. Columbus Public Health has been selected and awarded a grant as part of the 2020 Community Waste Reduction Program. The main objectives for the CPH grant program include providing food donation guidance to retail businesses and raising awareness of the local, local food waste, food insecurity, and potential benefits of food donation. Almost 10,000 food businesses are licensed by Columbus Public Health and Franklin County Public Health. Columbus Public Health and Franklin County Public Health will jointly issue guidance documents and create signage in English, Chinese, Spanish, Somali, Nepali, and Bhutanese to increase awareness of and opportunities for donation of edible food among, amongst licensed food retail businesses. And again, this is, Swaco is our partner and our local food action plan. They are responsible for goal four. And this particular grant will certainly be helpful, again, to making sure that um, we would be able to provide edible food to our community and give them guidance to do that. And if there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Gordon's passed. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. See no further business coming for council. May I have a motion to adjourn? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Meeting number eight is adjourned. Regular meeting number nine will now come to order. Clerk, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden.
Can I get a motion to dispense with the reading of the journal? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. We will now go to the zoning committee. Councilmember Tyson chairs that committee. All members serve on the committee. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Before beginning the zoning agenda, I'll briefly explain the rules of council as pertaining to speaking before council on zonings and variances. We, we permit three speakers on each side three proponents and three opponents, and we ask that they limit their remarks to, to three, three minutes on each side, and we provide an opportunity for rebuttal from the applicant. On the advice of the city attorney's office, we ask that anyone here this evening who wishes to speak either for or against any council variance, including staff, please stand, raise your right hand, And if you think you may have to come up and speak, please stand and raise your right hand. And be sworn in. I wish to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. Please answer, I will. I will. Thank you. The first ordinance is 30-2020 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3353.03 C2 permitted uses and 3361.02 CPD permitted uses of the Columbus City Codes for property located at 919 Old Henderson Road to permit a multi-unit residential development in the CPD Commercial Plan Development District. The applicant is Homeport. The proposed use is a multi-unit residential development the city department's recommendation is approval. The South Northwest Civic Association's recommendation is six to three. I would like to move to table to 224-2020. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Table. Thank you. The next ordinance is 117-2020 to grant a variance from provisions of sections 3363.01 manufacturing districts of the Columbus City Code for the property located at 1750 Maryland Avenue to permit a multi-unit residential development in the M Manufacturing District. The applicant is Central Ohio Opportunity Fund, LLC. The proposed use is a multi-unit residential development. The city department's recommendation is approval and the Near East Area Commission's recommendation is approval 10 to 0. If there are no questions or comments, I first move to amend to emergency. Second. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Amend it. Thank you. And now I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Pass. Thank you. The next ordinance is. Uh, ordinance number 2028-2020 to rezone 2565 Lockbourne Road, uh, being 6.38 acres located on the west side of Lockbourne Road, 850 feet south of State Route 104 from the LM2 Limited Manufacturing District to the LAR1 Limited Apartment Residential District. The uh, applicant is a community housing network the proposed use is a multi-unit residential development. The city department's recommendation is approval, and the Far South Area Commission's recommendation is disapproval, nine to two. I would now ask for a staff presentation. Good evening, council members. The site consists of two undeveloped parcels in the LM2 Limited Manufacturing District. The applicant requests the LAR1 Limited Apartment Residential District to permit a multi-unit residential development the maximum total of 100 dwelling units. The proposal will be constructed in two phases on two separate parcels. The limitation text establishes use restrictions and supplemental development standards that address the maximum number of dwelling units permitted, minimum building setbacks, vehicular and pedestrian access, fencing, landscaping, street trees, building materials, and parking lot lighting. The site is within the planning boundaries of the Tri-South Neighborhood Plan which recommends mixed use land uses at this location, a designation which includes multi-unit residential uses. Staff finds the proposed LAR1 limited apartment residential district to be consistent with the plan's land use recommendation 
while also committing to sufficient buffering and screening from neighboring properties, building materials, and a site plan within the limitation text. A concurrent council variance has been filed to reduce the minimum number of parking spaces required, to reduce the required minimum side yard permitted, to permit maneuvering and parking spaces to cross parcel lines, and to eliminate fronting requirements for phase two of the proposed development because the site will be maintained as two separate parcels, and therefore a city department's recommendation is for approval. Thank you. I will now ask for a presentation from the applicant. Please state your name and who you represent. Good evening, my name is Samantha Schuler, and I am the Chief Executive Officer of Community Housing Network and I uh, thank you for considering our rezoning application tonight. Also with me are, is uh, Tony Collins, the CEO of the YMCA in case uh, for any reason you have questions of, of them as well. Um, I think the staff did a great job of addressing land use issues, but I think tonight the actual focus is on our intended use. And so I'd like to just briefly address why this project is important, a little bit about permanent supportive housing, um, the uh, communications we've had with the community to date and why we chose this site. Um, the importance of the project is pretty straightforward. It's targeted to people who are uh, extremely low income and the affordable housing gap in Columbus is predominantly with this group of people, um, the 54,000 gap that we have. It's also targeted to people who have been experienced chronic homelessness, so they've been homeless for over a year. Uh, homelessness is on the rise in Columbus as we grow, so does that population, 7% since 2017. Uh, CS Community Shelter Board estimates that there are 1,500 people in a given year who need uh, permanent supportive housing because they're homeless, but only 450 units available. So clearly we need more. And then finally, the YMCA's 40 West Long Street building, as um, Sue Darby, who's their senior vice president of housing, always eloquently says, that building has served our community very well for over 100 years, but it's um, at the end of its useful life. And we need to be proactive about um, finding housing for those folks before it needs to close, particularly the 140 or so men who were homeless and are now at stably housed with the Y who are in um, programs and have case managers. We need to avoid them being homeless again. So the YMCA will be our service partner and they will make sure that the case managers who are serving those men now um, follow them to the site so they can have continuity of care. And for those three very important reasons, this project is the number one priority for the continuum of care, and that's our community's organized way of trying to address these issues. Um, this, if, we're, if we're fortunate enough to be rezoned and to get funded, the city will um, contribute uh, federal funds, about a half a million dollars, and that will leverage over $11 million in capital over $530,000 a year in operating subsidy from the Columbus Metropolitan Housing Authority through project-based Section 8, and over $150,000 a year annually in services through the Continuum of Care and HUD. So with a modest investment, a lot of leveraged resources for our community to start to address these very important issues. Permanent supportive housing um, is a proven model. Community Housing Network has been actually working on this model. We were a pioneer in it. Since 1987, we were formed. Um, we now own 1,200 units scattered at 140 different sites and 32 different zip codes in Franklin County. Um, but we didn't do permanent supportive housing by ourselves. We, of course, were at the beginning, but many other housing providers across the nation have also been using permanent supportive housing as an intervention for people who experience homelessness and have disabilities. It is a now, in those 30 years that we've been doing it, a nationally used model. It is a proven model. It is a best practice, and it is evidence-based. That means that we don't just make up the components. The components have been tested, and it works. It works to help vulnerable populations uh, access and maintain their housing. It keeps them safe. It keeps our residents, our staff safe, and it keeps our community safe. It helps us have a positive impact on, our, on um, the communities that we're a part of. Um, in particular, though, the reason it works is the people that we serve are able to live independently. They can sign a lease, understand a lease, they can follow expectations. They aren't, they aren't disabled to the extent that they need to be institutionalized. They can live in our communities. 
but their disability sometimes cause um, a gap for them that uh, gets in the way of them thriving. And that's where the permanent supportive housing comes in. If we have tailored individual services available readily for them, they will be very successful. That means that we have somebody on site 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and we have uh, very, very robust services. So Monday through Friday, if you come to one of our sites, you're gonna have an average of four people on site to serve them 13 hours a day, sometimes five to six people, um, including service provision, 12 hours a day, and two for nine hours a day. And then on the weekends, from seven to five, so 10 hours, you will have two people on site, and five of those hours will be with the service provider. We do that because that's the model that works to make sure that we are doing um, the best practice. And um, so I, I wanted to just make sure that everyone understood um, what permanent part of housing was. Um, we did begin reaching out to the community as soon as we had um, got a contract for the land and put the plans together and could file our rezoning. Uh, we began meeting with the community in October and we've met with them in November, December, January, and we're working, trying to work through a good neighbor agreement. We certainly will continue to do that if we're fortunate enough to be zoned. The zoning isn't where we, why we do a good neighbor agreement. We do a good neighbor agreement because it's the right thing to do. It's the way that we connect to the community and build trust, and then that helps our residents, when they move in, have a way of connecting to the community. Um, and so we'll continue to work through that. To date, we've agreed um, to uh, screen out sex offenders and other crimes um, that were uh, violent felonies and those sorts of things when they have, um, but with a time limit. So if a person has passed the time that they've been convicted, they, they would be eligible. Um, but we also made sure that the permanent support of housing components are part of the good neighbor agreement. So things like cameras and 24 seven coverage and, and tenant expectations are part of that. And then the community made some requests that we were able to accommodate. We, I won't go over all of them, but the, the most important ones is that we originally proposed 120 units and we dropped to 120. We originally proposed having all of the units be available to the transfer of the Y, but people were concerned with it being 100% men, and so we dropped it to 80% initially. Over time, as units turn, we believe that the mix will be more similar to what it is now in all permanent supportive housing, 65% men, 35% women. Um, we also committed to perimeter fencing and landscaping and a building envelope and to be part of the neighborhood group, including bringing quarterly updates um, to the Far South Area Commission and um, participating with the Marion Franklin uh, Civic Association in helping with fundraising events. Um, we also know that in particular, the, there are two things that are of concern to the neighborhood. The bus stop, there is a bus stop in front of our site and the daycare that's adjacent to our site. Um, for the bus stop, we will, um, we've already asked the um, schools if they will move that bus stop while, during construction so that, that there aren't kids there while we're constructing. Um, but also, we agreed to, um, uh, in conversations today, to have somebody with a security training monitor that bus stop during pickup. It's from 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning and during drop-off, which is, I think, uh, 2.40 to 4.30 in the, in the uh, afternoon for the first six months that we're operating, and then continue after those six months to work with the neighborhood group to see what their concerns are about that bus stop and make sure we're addressing them. Um, for the daycare, we agreed to have perimeter fencing and to work on other text alerts that may be helpful. I will say that um, screening out sex offenders is obviously a huge part of making sure that the site is safe. Um, we've been asked why the site, why next to a daycare, and we operate um, property all over the city. We're in proximity to children all over the city, not just daycares. Um, we're, we're very experienced with operating safely. The model works and we, and we know how to do it. We have a site, for example, um, South Point, where we have 40 family units right next to our 40 singles. We have a site at Parsons that's been there for, since at least 2000. It's about 900 feet from the Southside Early Childhood Center. We're about to build and open a 60 unit even closer, 200 feet, right across the street. And that rezoning came before this council. Um, and so I understand that um, 
there is a lot of concern about us being near this daycare, but what I can tell you is that in our experience, permanent supportive housing does not negatively impact um, communities, including children. And if we thought for a moment that opening this site would bring harm to children, we would not choose the site and we would not be here asking your rezoning. So, um, of course, people may have a different opinion, but I want to stress that in our experience, the things that um, people are concerned about, we have not seen that occur. We chose this site for a lot of different reasons, some of them really technical. It's a growing city. It's actually very difficult to find vacant land in Columbus. Uh, we serve people who are extremely low income. They must have a bus service that's frequent because that's the way they get to employment into other parts of the city, so that narrows our choices. We also have some funders who have policies that um, make it a little bit more difficult for us to find land. By the time they issue the rules we, and the time we have to submit our application, we have to have it appropriately zoned, so that's a very narrow frame sometimes. They make us not buy the site until we're fully funded and they've done their environmental review, so you have to find a landowner who will hold in contract for 18 months, and very few private owners want to do that. Um, and then. We always look for amenities like grocery stores, pharmacies, parks, um, rec centers, libraries, banks, those sorts of things nearby, but our funder wants it within a mile perimeter. And um, so if you find a grocery store that's 1.1 miles, it doesn't count. So you can imagine that narrows your choices. We looked at 18 different sites. Four of them were suitable, and only one landowner was, was willing to enter into a contract with us given all those parameters. Um, and so we chose the site in part for those technical reasons, but frankly, um, we chose the site because it's a great site. It's, it's got great amenities and, it is in, and it's a great community with a, with a long tradition and a lot of pride. And the people that we serve, um, they face stigma. And of course there's laws that protect them, but they don't always, um, they're not always able to avail themselves of that and they often find themselves disconnected and frankly disenfranchised. And they want what all of us want, and that's a safe, peaceful place to live, but mostly they want to connect again. Um, they've been disconnected for a long time, and we try to find communities where they can find that sense of belonging um, that the rest of us enjoy. And so we, if we're, if we're uh, lucky enough to get this zoning and develop this project, we look forward to offering them the opportunity to be in such a great community. So I hope that helps, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay. Any questions for Ms. Shuler? Well, seeing that we'll have speakers, and then you'll have an opportunity to come up and give some rebuttal. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, the, uh, the way this works, we will start with the speakers who are for a project, and then we'll have the speakers that are against the project. And there can only be you know, three for, three against. We'll also hear from the, um, if there's a representative of the Area Commission here, and I know that we do have someone from the Area Commission, Mr. Michael Walker will also have an opportunity to speak, and then we'll ask the applicant to come back and respond with the rebuttal with the, with, um, within three minutes. And so our first speaker is Ms. Stephanie Cole. Following Ms. Cole will be um, Ms. Sheila Prillerman and then um, Karen Fields. Good evening. Good evening. Please you state your name and who you represent. Hi, I'm Stephanie Coe. Um, I am the chair of the Southwest Area Commission, although I am not here tonight to represent them. Um, President Harden, members of council, I'm here to support this application. A number of months ago, I became aware that they were working forward, working towards this project and that there was a lot of community concern. Um, so I reached out. I've attended uh, the zoning meeting of the Far South Area Commission and, and some other meetings. What I wanted to describe was our experience in the Southwest area with permanent supportive housing. Um, we have the Briggsdale facility on Harrisburg Pike that originally in 06 had 35 units. In 2018, they opened 40 more units. It's across the street from our meeting location. And uh, then there's the Van Buren Center down in the West Edge Business Park that has 100 units that opened in 2016. Uh, candidly, the residents of these units have been some of our most um, uh, 
um, repetitive volunteers for activities and events. When we have neighborhood cleanups, it's the residents who come out to help us. I want to be clear, not cleaning up their trash, but cleaning up our trash from other parts of the community. They've assisted us with national night out activities, setting up, tearing down, those kinds of things. Um, I live about a mile from the Briggsdale facility and have since 2000. Six, um, and we have never been aware of a single issue. And I felt like when I heard the original concerns that this was really a sense of fear of the unknown, of not knowing what to expect um, with these communities. But uh, again, our experience has been that they not only are well run and the supports in place for the residents are, are um, there to help them thrive in our community, but the residents have become members of our community, which is one of the things that I think they're looking for is how they've been able to interact with other residents, other communities. We have a school that's almost just behind um, one of these facilities, actually both of them. Um, so we, we have similar uh, geography in the sense to this particular location. When I attended the meeting in the fall, I know one of the outcomes was that they opened up the Briggsdale facility for members of the Far South Area Commission and, and others who were concerned to tour it to actually see what we were talking about instead of just this theoretical idea. So again, I stand here tonight to support the work that these organizations do in our community and ensuring that the residents who are members of our community get the needed services and the opportunity to have safe, affordable housing within all of our neighborhoods. And I've said this before and I will stand behind it that we would welcome Welcome another permanent supportive facility in our community. They are our great neighbors. And again, as was said before, they haven't entered into good neighbor agreements to get our support. They've entered into good neighbor agreements and more importantly, good neighbor practices to be good neighbors. And we've had a great experience, so I just wanted to share that. Thank you all. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Cole? Same man. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Ms. Sheila Prillerman. My name is Sheila Prillerman. I'm an advocate for the homeless. I've been an advocate for the homeless since 1998. I'm also an Army veteran. I'm here asking that you reconsider zoning for Marion Franklin Far South Side community. Here in the city of Columbus, Franklin County, we are facing a growing crisis, not enough affordable housing. With the YMCA closing downtown, we will have another and added overabundance of homeless people. I would ask that you consider what will happen if we do not build and or make room for those people who have already been displaced or who will be displaced. Do you want to see folks sleeping, say, in alleys, vacant buildings, sidewalks, our city parks? It is time that we open our eyes those same people that you do not want in your neighborhood are people that you may work with. They're people who may work at your favorite store, your favorite bar, your favorite restaurant. We need to just open our eyes and see that stable housing for one is st um, stability for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Karen Fields, please. Good evening, please state your name and who you represent. Good evening, my name is Karen Fields and I'm representing myself, so not okay. an organization. Um, again, my name is Karen Fields. I've been a registered nurse for over 20 years and I've had the fortune of working with and learning from patients and clients who have experienced homelessness while trying to deal with other social determinants of health. I own a home in the 4207 zip code area my daughter and grandchildren also live in this community. I believe in inclusion. Neither race, religion, gender, socioeconomic status, nor any other characteristic should have any bearing on a person's right to have a home where they can store their belongings rather than carrying them around on their back all day. Everyone wants to be accepted within their community and to be counted as someone of value despite labels that get assigned through misunderstanding and fear. I am here today to express my support for this housing project. We need this for low-income single adults 
In a former position that I held, I worked intricately with community housing network staff, both at the table and in the field. I can recall names and stories with the most wonderful outcomes, and they were related to the housing and the supportive care my clients received from CHN staff. My late sister, who was separated from her family for many years, battled homelessness and mental illness after the death of her daughter. She was placed in CHN housing a year before she lost her courageous battle with cancer. I could go on and on about what it meant to her to have her own place, to take her daughter's belongings out of the storage unit and place them in her apartment so that she could be surrounded by the things that brought her comfort. I urge you to see a bigger picture, one of inclusion. We can build bridges in our community and it can thrive. Let's not focus on exclusion. I would encourage you to consider adding and fixing sidewalks, collaborating with CODA to have more bus routes, uh, especially between the Marion Franklin Village and the Great Southern area, and to continue to revitalize the South Columbus area with more businesses and community service organizations. So please give my testimony your utmost consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fields. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Seeing none, I'm now going to ask Ms. Shirlene Anderson to please come to the podium. And after Ms. Anderson, we'll hear from um, Melissa Johnson and Jerome Ferguson. Good evening, Ms. Anderson. Please Good state evening. your name and who you represent. Shirlene Anderson here representing the Marion Franklin Southfield community. Good evening, council people. This has been a battle. CHM was to work with our neighborhood at the onset of this project, and that did not happen. And in some of my research in um, having an understanding of what CHM does, um, this is something that I read. It says CHN proactively works with the community using the development process to form long-term neighborhood connections using the community acceptance approach prior to property development. That did not happen. Their developer and um, Mr. Perry used our Tri-South neighborhood plan to present to you all about the misuse mixed use that they said we wanted in our community. But what we really were more interested in was senior um, facility, condos, grocery store, but not two, three story apartment buildings in our community because currently we have no apartments. We believe that a two, three story building would be very intrusive to our neighborhood and as it's been shared, being next to our daycare and the facility is going to house 100 men coming from the Y, it does bring some concern to the community. Um, South Point, one of the facilities was used and of the 629 police runs from the Columbus Police Department, 111 of these runs were made to the South Point facility. The majority of those calls were made from CHN staff. Many of the reasons being because it houses people with substance abuse and mental illness. Many of the calls were say a tenant did not take their meds. So then they are a little radical and out of control. Imagine that being next to the Southfield community. We have the support of our community in Southfield Stand up. These are the people who voted at the Marion Franklin Civic Association, a strong no. It went to the Far South Area Commission, no. We are asking today that you take into consideration 
the heart of our children. We support CHN. We support Church for All People. We support anyone who has a care for the homelessness. But we are asking that you take into consideration the site, our children, and vote no. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Any questions for Ms. Anderson? The next speaker is Ms. Melissa Johnson. Please state your name and who you represent. My name is Melissa Johnson, and I am the owner of Starting Point and Anderson and Holding that owns the land and addresses are ranging from 2505 to 2533 Lockbourne Road. My mother lives next door to Starting Point in the house my grandfather bought for us in 1994. The house and Starting Point was my grandfather's way of ensuring safety for his grandchildren and the children that live in this community. Our home and business are along the entire north property line of the proposed rezoning site as well as this east property line. These business, businesses and land have served and have kept safe over 5,000 children over the year. Years. Starting Point has maintained the state of Ohio's five-star step of the quality rating since the rating system was created. Help us ensure safety for children by voting no or tabling the CHM rezoning property for 100 at risk of homeless who are disabled by mental illness, drug addiction, living zero feet away from our infants and children who catch the Columbus City School bus stop, attend preschool at Starting Point, and receive math and reading tutoring. Vote no because documents for it to all of us state that CHN tenants can be convicted of a violent crime or drug-related felony, domestic violence, human trafficking, or misdemeanor, serve a state average sentence of 2.5 years, and be one of, if not all, of the tenants living in the property zero feet away from our children. Vote no because documents submitted to all of us state that CHN will only start steps to evict if illegal prohib prohib prohibited activities are consistent zero feet away from where children play and go to school. Vote no because in the past year alone, CHN dispatched police runs, including drug overdose, drinking and drunkenness, fighting suicide attempts, threatening safety, smoking marijuana on the premises, arguing unauthorized tenants spending the night and refusing to leave, psychotic behavior from being off medication, inappropriate touching, domestic violence, and high off other drugs. 650 pages of police reports from only 11 of their sites, the ones they sent us to go look at. Councilman Shannon Hardin stated to me that he was going to vote yes today, that he had listened to the community on something else and voted on, and he, lo he loses sleep at night over it. But sh he shared the hardest part about voting yes for this CHM rezoning was that it was located next close to children. I beg you, Shannon, please add more, please don't add more sleeplessness nights to you by not being 100% sure that you're not putting children in harm's way. Councilwoman Pris Priscilla Tyson stated to me that we have to hurry up and vote on this because CHN won't get the money they need if we don't vote today. She stated to me that everyone is not going to get what they want when it comes to CHN, CHN rezoning project. My hopes and prayers are that all that have the power to vote today see things the way my grandfather and I see it. Safety for children is not a want but a necessity. Ensuring safety for children means voting no or tabling this project. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, we want to, I, I will certainly want to address a couple things and I don't know if anyone else would want to address that. I, um, I just want to be very clear. Um, I, what my statement was, if we were going to move this project forward and since certainly um, Ms. Schuler certainly stated the length of time of the project, that based upon these types of projects to be successful have to have low income tax credits and that we had to be able to vote on it today should we be for them to be able to have the credits to be able to do this development mm -hmm. that's my statement it wasn't about 
you know, just got to get the money. That was not my statement. It's really a statement on how low income, how these projects work. If we're going to serve residents in our community who are in need of affordable housing, we, they have to be able to have low income tax credits and there are deadlines for that mm -hmm. to happen. And again, it's a very different statement than it's like, we just care about the money. It's really about how a project, how a project works. And I also just wanted to state that we do care about our children's safety. And that is really why I have had a couple conversations with you about safety. We care about all our residents' safety, our children, our seniors, all residents, and individuals who are absolutely dealing, because they're residents too, with homelessness. We care about safety of all of our residents. And certainly, want to look at the entire picture of what's going on. I have certainly have had a number of conversations and safety has been your number one issue and we have been trying to work on is there a way and I, what I said was no, if in a situation like this when you have two groups of people that don't want, want one way what something and something does it, we really do try to compromise to figure out what could be done because we're looking at the issues of our whole community. That's what, make sure my statements are really clear. Are there any questions or comments that anyone would like to, to make with Ms. Johnson? Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Jerome Ferguson. Good evening, please state your name and who you represent. Before I state my name, I did give to President Harding a copy, a correct, it should be a corrected copy, a way the area commission voted. This document said that they approved it, it was disapproved. And so I please ask that you take that in consideration as you think about this vote. My name is Jerome Ferguson from the Marion Franklin Civic Association and I'm a registered voter. I'm here tonight on behalf of this community to ask that you vote no on the rezoning. We've talked about this project over since October, and we keep hearing about homelessness. The Southfield community is all for supporting homeless activities and, and, and affordable housing. We asked if they came to us in the beginning, we would have did affordable housing homeless for families. We were told that there was not a homeless family problem in Columbus, and we know that is not true. The main issue is, it's not about the homelessness. This is a mental issue that we're voting on tonight. The way they get their funding is because of the mental issue, not just the homelessness. And so what we're looking at is a facility right now that has 600 plus police runs. If the city attorney was here right now, or the chief of police was here right now, they would tell you to shut it down. But what we're doing right now is putting a blind eye over the whole thing about mental illness. Mental illness in those 600 plus police runs, that's not just because they're bad people. It's because they haven't taken their medicine. And we know we can't, we can't order them to take their medicine, but we know what the outcome is as they fight and hit other people in their buildings because of their mental state, because they walk around and just touch people for no reason because of their mental state. Well, you're going to take them out of downtown and you're going to put them next to a daycare. So that building they used to argue with, that building they used to fight with, those tenants they used to fight with, they're going to mess around and touch one of our children. Safety and the well-being of our children should always be at the forefront. There is no give and take on that. Look at those children back there. If it was your child, you wouldn't want them next door. And so I'm asking you today, we were told when they first came to this meeting, to meet with the community that our vote did not matter. The project's gonna go through regardless. It's guaranteed. We heard that at a civic association meeting. It is guaranteed. In this year, 2020, in Black History Month, nobody in this community should ever be told that their vote don't count. So we have knocked on doors for you and knocked down doors for you to stand up for us 
And so tonight, I'm asking each one of you, we voted for you as a team, but tonight is your accountability for you individually. Stand up for this community. Not because we're against homelessness. You just heard another person for the project. They'll gladly have another a tenant there. Move that individual all men facility over there. Give us a homeless family facility and we'll support that. So I'm asking you tonight to stand with us. And for the nurse that stood up here tonight, Channel 10 just did a story on it. Before you cast your vote, there are people being beat in the hospitals for this. Mental issue is the issue. Vote for us. Stand up for these children. Stand up for the homeless people. Make this a win-win for the city and for the voters. We voted you in to stand up for us and for everyone, not just those who are homeless and mental illness. We care about them. But you cannot ignore the fact 800 plus police runs. The possibility of someone being injured, not just the child, but the individual who has the mental illness, this is on your watch as fast as you vote tonight. This will be on your watch, not only today, not only tomorrow, but in generations to come. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Look within yourself. And if you ever wonder why a canary would lose their oxygen, it's because that canary in that cage, they don't have a voice. If you take what the community just voted, the Civic Association voted, no. There are more no's in your packet, and I pray y'all ready, than there are yeses. So right now, we support the homeless community, but we're asking that this project does not be rezoned and have CHN, don't reward them for not doing their homework, knowing that they got another person that wants that project. Don't ignore and reward them for not coming to us first. And don't ignore the fact that they took your vote away when they told us that every chance they got, this project's approved. Your actions tonight will tell us how it's going to turn out. I thank you for your time and God bless you. And God bless everybody in this chamber. Because I tell you this, we care about homelessness. We care about people. We care about the least of these. But we care about doing things right. Nothing this so right should be this hard. And there's people in here conflicting. They may not speak to one another again because we're rushing a project for what? A tax credit, one tax credit. That should not be the end. And certainly we do appreciate um, the um, certainly the support for um, s certainly for Mr. Ferguson, but we in council chambers the decorum is we don't we don't clap we don't boo we don't that's not the decorum in here and the expectation is that that would happen in in this space. I respect and, that. And so that's not how we operate in this space. Um, Again, I want to make the correction that this isn't all men. I think that's been said by a couple speakers that this project today is a uh, hundred individuals, and it would be looking at 80-20. It will be 70-30, and uh, that's want to make sure I make that that correction um, on this particular project. Are there um, any questions for uh, Mr. Ferguson? Our children. No questions. No questions. No questions. Thank you. We will now. Um, so the I said that Mr. Walker would be the speaker for the uh, the area commission, but I think that Mr. Mr. Walker has stated that he would like for Mr. Patterson to speak on his behalf. And so, Mr. Patterson, you will have, um, a, you can now speak as an area commissioner um, on this project. Mr. 
please state your name and who you represent. My name is Robert Patterson. I'm the president of the Maryland Franklin Civic Association, and I'm the zoning chair for the Fall South Side Commission. And I'll make sure I'm clear, but Mr. was Mr. Walker, he's a new chair? No. Or not? He's not. We got two chairs. You're, the, you're co chairing? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Perfect. Yes, ma Thank you. Okay. I just kept here to let y'all know something. Oh, okay. I just kept here to talk to y'all for a few. I don't know if you'd have made up your mind or not, but I just want y'all to think and listen for a minute. They said they had went out and checked other properties. I don't think half y'all know what Southfield is, and I don't think half you know where you've been. But if you go out Refugee Road, it's six lots out there that's vacant. You talked about the bus, the bus run out there. It's nothing in Southfield but schools, families, and this. And you talked about, he talked about what you went back and did. You didn't do nothing but plant a few bushes around the place and put up a six foot privacy fence. You got a three foot wall. You stand on the first floor, you can see over the wall. We got a daycare, we got a recreation center, we got a library, and we got schools. That's what we are thinking about. And I'm not telling you, the lady got him up here and talked about the people and this or that. I know what been at the Y. I know what live at the Y. I don't talk about nobody else but my family. I had three of them at the Y. I had one young man that died from an overdose, and he died at the Y. I can prove it. I got two more of them that was a drug pusher at the Y. If they want me, I can prove it to them. They're my family, but I hate to tell on them. But they was there. You go through the, go when the wild was in the summertime, they'd be standing out there on the side of the street, urinating and everything else. So don't tell me you got people that's going to check them. Because the police department said the 13 precinct is the biggest one in Columbus. We called for police. If you're not dead or getting shot, it takes the police at least two hours to get over there. My grandson came here for Christmas. His car got hit and told the first thing the police asked me, is someone dead or what? I told him, no, his car just got tough. We're going to put in a report. It took him two hours and 15 minutes to get over there. We'd have had houses broken in the I'm not going to say it's going to increase or decrease or what. But don't say we got people sitting in this place. It's going to take care of our kids. Think about that. I'm not asking you. I'm asking you to delay the vote. Go out and look at other properties. You talk about what they're out on a court right. You got Kroger's, you got drug stores, you got everything else. And they got apartments out there. They got great big apartments out there. Go out in Southfield, they got houses, they got families. And don't say that they're going to interact with the people because they're not. If you don't have a person that's a drug addict in your family, don't tell me that they're going to be friends with this or that. They're not. And you cannot, and I was told that you cannot force a person to go into treatment. If they don't want to take the medicine, you cannot make them take the medicine. You know you can't. If they want to go out and do this, do this, you go back, and what you going to do with them? Nothing. You're just going to tell them. And they come up with all these other excuses, and the good neighbor agreement they gave us is nothing. Have you read it? Mm -hmm. Have any of y'all read the good neighbor agreement mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. sent out? Yes. What is it? They disagree with everything we asked them. They told us it cost too much money for the police report we asked for. They, uh, everything they said was too much money. It cost too much. It cost too much. If you're caring about people, what do money matter? It doesn't matter. You got children. You look on the news every day where you got a a man going to jail now for touching a young girl, for doing this. Think, think, think about those. And then when something happened, well, we didn't think this one. We had somebody sitting in the office. What's somebody sitting in behind that glass door gonna do out there in the city? I'm not gonna say it's, it don't, uh, we don't have bad people over there, but ain't no sense throwing a whole bunch more unless you're gonna tell me you're gonna have a police guard sitting there. They said no. They said they don't have no security guards sitting there. We got people sitting in there. You don't have to go to 
them classes if you don't want. They said that out of their mouth, all mouth. So what is it going to do to make those people do that? Now, you can go in there, you can have your friends up there, you can do what you want to do. Now ask them. Now that's what they told us. There's nothing that I'm making up. They told us at our meetings. I'm just asking you to delay the vote. Make them go out there, or have them to go out there, and look at those other problems out there. If they want me, I ride with them out there to show them. There's properties out there. They are out there. That's all I'm asking. To think about, to think about the people. And y'all talk about the neighborhoods going down, the neighborhoods going down. We are struggling like the devil, trying to fill our neighborhood up. And you're going to then say, well, this is a good neighborhood. Let's put them out there. What does that happen? You're putting all this money in the west side, up north, trying to build the neighborhoods back up. Our neighborhood is not going down yet. It's, but yet you're going to bring it down. Come on, let's, let's think about the people. Just think about us. I know you said it's time, my time is up, but that's all right, that's all right. But I just want you to think. Before you sit up here and say, well, that's all right. Think. That's all I should do is think. Questions? Are there any questions for Mr. Patterson? Please. I think there's been a number of topics that have come up, and, and I want to make sure that they get addressed. So I don't know if, Sam, if you want to address the individuals who are currently at the Y. I don't know if it's you or if it's Tony or if it's Ms. Darby that who happened to be at, at our Y. Um, because I absolutely know that they're not, not all individuals in permanent supportive housing. There's other individuals who have an opportunity to live at the downtown Y that are not a part of the program. So we ha I want us to be careful of, you know, mixing every single person together that's there because there's different types of housing at the Y. And I, I don't know if it's, if Sam, do you want to address the, the average age of individuals that are there, who happens to be there, or does does the Y want to address that and the services that they offer? Because there's a number of issues that have come up. So Mr. Patterson, they're going to come up and certainly um, provide a rebuttal to share, mm -hmm. to answer some of, the quest some of the questions or issues that have come up that I think we need to, to address. Whichever one, okay. Thank you. So I've got Sue with me, uh, Sue Darby, Senior right. Vice President of Housing, just in case I um, don't get all my facts right. But Sue, would you talk a little bit about the people in, at the Y now? So Mr. Patterson, you can probably yeah. sit over here. <laughs> and then Thank I'll you. talk about the profile. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so right now we have 403 men that live at the 40 West Long location. 143 are part of the permanent supportive housing um, program. We have 100 individuals that are being serviced by Alvis in their incarceration program. We have 130 men that pay regular rent and they are in no, not associated with any program at all. So that's the makeup of that building. The average age of these individuals that we're specifically talking about is 54 years old. Um, most of them um, because they have experienced homelessness, has a, a pretty good decline of physical health, and they are just trying to have a peaceful, safe place to live while they become whole. So, uh, so was that? Yeah. Is there any more thing else? So, and just to make sure, the 143 that are already in program are the ones that would be eligible for this one. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we've talked about that being permanent supportive housing. So, 143. Um, 80 of those individuals be going to this facility. Is there any questions that you wanted me to address? Okay. Sorry. There's some for the, that this, for Sue. Okay. Council Member Remy has a question I think you'd like okay. to ask you. Yeah, I'd like to know more about the 143. So, okay. I mean, if you could speak to, you know, they're not all convicted felons or, you oh, know, absolutely. convicted. You know, they, they aren't all have mental health issues. They don't sure. all have drug 
issues? I mean, can you talk about some of the makeup of these 143 individuals? Absolutely. So the 143 that we serve, um, all of them have two qualities, as which Sam said earlier, which is they have to have an extensive homelessness history, chronic homelessness, and they have to have a disability. And mental health is only one of the disabilities that they may have. It could be um, addiction. It could be physical. It can be a cognitive delay. But there, there is another disability that's associated with that. The makeup specifically of those 143, we have about 46% that claim mental health as their, as their disability. The rest, it's a mixture of, of physical um, ailments and cognitive. We, we do have some that are in de developmentally delayed also. Are any of the, um, some of them veterans as well? Yes, sir. I know some questions have come up about the number of uh, police runs. Can you address those, I, that issue? I'm Thank you. Sure. So I heard a, a few different numbers tonight. I heard 111, I heard 600, I heard 800. I don't know how many units they're looking at. I've never seen the police runs, and I don't know what time frame they're talking about. Um, but uh, so we do incident logs. Uh, so we took a look at 180 units that we have in three different buildings, all on the south side. Our incident logs showed 42 police runs for those 180 units on average. Uh, so in other words, 0.42 per unit on those 180. So we took that number and said over 100 units, we could expect 42 police runs uh, for the Marion Franklin area if we were to build there. Um, uh, my understanding is in that precinct 13, they get about 38,000 calls a year. So we're talking about one tenth of 1% if we had 42 calls in a year. Um, even if it's the 111, I think they said went to one site, that's still three tenths of 1% of those 38,000 calls in that area. Um, and so I think it's important that when we're talking about numbers and data, uh, if we're going to make decisions on them, we need to understand those. Um, how many units um, and how does that compare to the general population? Um, I also, if, if I could take the opportunity to address a few other things, but I'll be happy to answer questions first if you'd like. Yeah, so I, I heard um, a couple things I just wanted to make sure I addressed. Um, one is the idea that we don't evict people when they, um, when they violate their lease, and that we just let them continue to violate their lease and never do anything about it. And it isn't true. What we try to, what we try to communicate is that we are there to help people maintain their housing. And so to the extent that we can help them when, when they are having issues, we do that. But if they aren't good neighbors and they're posing any sort of um, unsafe environment for themselves, for the other tenants, for our staff or the community, then we certainly will not let them remain in the housing. So when we say that we work with people, it's usually minor violations, like <laughs> not paying us rent. It's usually where, where we end up having to have conversations about it, but we're not gonna evict them immediately. We're gonna try to figure out how to get them income. So we wanna be very open and honest with the neighborhood about how we operate. But sometimes that gets interpreted that we um, allow people to uh, be negative in the environment, and that's not true. Um, it's also really important to understand the service model. And this is where I talk about permanent supportive housing as an evidence-based model. Where we have to have fidelity to it to work. And here's one of the most important things is that services are voluntary. That gets interpreted then that we just let people do whatever they want. If they want to have a bunch of people in and have parties and do drugs, hey, no problem. Services are voluntary. That's absolutely not the case. It is not how it operates. The reason that services are voluntary is because um, really twofold. You're, you're talking about people who have been in a system that, that they have had a negative experience with and that often they're required to do things um, and so they, they uh, are no longer um, trusting of that system. So once you force somebody to do something and, and they've already had an experience where they don't trust people, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work as an intervention, right? But also just people in general only 
avail themselves to change when they're ready to change, and they only um, are excited about services because they've chosen them. We all want autonomy, same with our residents. So if we were to force services on them, even if we could under the model, the services then would not be effective. We'd be self-defeating. So that's why we say services are voluntary, that's the way they work. But we expect people to sign a lease, to behave by that lease, to follow the building rules, to be good neighbors. And when they don't do that, we treat them like all other adults who fail to follow their lease and follow rules. We evict them from the building. So if they don't want services to help them follow the lease, that's fine, they can no longer live there. We won't let people live in this building if they're going to be a threat to other people. So I thought that was important to point, to point out. Uh, a lot of people have talked about security and what we're willing to do. And then besides the robust staffing that we have, we have agreed to monitor the bus station for the bus stop for the first six months. Um, that's a, a significant um, uh, operational burden for us, and, but, but we understand that the community is very concerned and they don't have a track record with us and that they are um, concerned that permanent supportive housing in their neighborhood just won't work. So we, we want to help um, make sure they understand that it can work and we will commit to that. So we, we do have security. There's cameras outside, inside. There's somebody sitting at a front desk 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, watching that door and who comes in and also watching those cameras that see the perimeter of the building and everything inside. So we're very committed to security and safety. Um, and I believe those were the, the main things I wanted to say other than we know that the neighborhood group never believes that we've come to them soon enough. It's just, it's, we hear this every time. And, and, we, and we understand because they don't want us there. So if they'd, we'd come earlier, they would have said no earlier. Um, so we, we know that we're gonna have to continue to work on these good neighbor agreements. Um, and we're committed to continuing to um, find out ways that we can have interventions that make the community feel safe, but are also improve the safety for our, our tenants and staff as well. So I'd be happy to answer any other questions you have. Councilmember Hardin. Thank you. President uh, Hardin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I, I just wanted to, to be specific with what you said about the uh, additional person that would watch the bus stop. You have agreed to a six-month trained security person that would watch the bus stop um, at, during uh, load in times in the morning and afternoon two hours I believe correct agreed to at in the in the evening so you have the security services inside the, the building you have the cameras uh, position you have a security staff or person behind the desk but then you have agreed to do an additional person that will sit or physically be at the bus stop during those times for six months and then you will come back and work with the community and, and council to see it, it where we go, if there are any security concerns that have happened within that six-month period. Is that what you're agreeing to? Correct, that is what we are agreeing to. Okay. Council Member Favor. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for uh, your testimony and your advocacy in this space. Um, could you speak to, um, after hearing the community's concerns, um, and uh, their desire to support permanent supportive housing, but something that would be more conducive to that site being that it's uh, less than 100 feet from the daycare. Mm -hmm. uh, why not have families uh, that are experiencing homelessness um, at that site, splitting the baby, so yeah. to speak? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so permanent supportive housing is an intervention that we use in the homeless system for people who um, are disabled and have been homeless because it's a very serviced enriched environment. And so it is really targeted to just that population. So among people who are homeless, it tends to be who, people who are single, not families, who are both homeless and have a disability and they need that support service 
Families, on the other hand, who um, find themselves homeless, the vast majority is what they call episodic. In other words, they have, um, they're not, they don't have a disability that requires them to live on a site that is so serviced and enriched. Instead, they've just, they've just run into some, some really bad luck. You know, they, they lost a job and they um, lost their car and next thing they know they're homeless. And what they really just need is some rapid intervention to help bridge that income issue and they don't need someone to build them permanent supportive housing. So there's a completely separate program for families, rapid rehousing, um, that the Community Shelter Board and, the, and HUD and the Continued Care are focused on funding. And it isn't, it isn't on permanent supportive housing. So there simply isn't a prioritization for that or funding available for that. It's not the, it's not the Continuum of Care's um, intervention for, for family homelessness. Sorry, Councilmember Remy. Thank you. Um, I am somewhat familiar with this because we went through this process in Northland uh, back in 2016 with Northgate and Laurel Green, um, which is now open and looks, you know, obviously you wouldn't know what it was if you didn't know what it was um, as far as physically. Could you talk a little bit about um, the training that your staff receives, what the resident manager training, you know, what those expectations are for that type of person Absolutely. Uh, first and foremost so, so there's two different staffing um, two different t staff types on site so we have the community housing network staff that staff is all trained in um, mental like, you know basic mental health and addiction um, understandings they're also trained in de-escalation techniques they're trained in um, things that you would expect CPR those sorts of things and they're trained um, how to uh, engage with people in a way that, that helps uh, connect that person to services. That's the CHN staff. And then we partner with the YMCA. Now the YMCA is car for credited. So, so they are actually a service provider that will bring mental health professionals who have a degree and a background in licensing. And so they'll, they'll provide the case management on site. They also have an employment specialist who's trained in how to connect people to employment opportunities. So of course their training is much, much deeper than just de-escalation. It's all the things one would need to become a mental health professional and licensed. Councilmember Liz Brown. Thank you, council member. Um, could you describe, uh, clarify a little bit what the perimeter wall is um, around the daycare, between the daycare? Just describe it. Yeah, so we've agreed to put a six foot high, and I think six feet's the max you can do under the city code, so that's why six feet wooden fence around the perimeter, including around the daycare center. Um, we're open to other um, buffering that people may want. We just, to date, uh, haven't had a, an opportunity for, for people to tell us what they want. So it's around your perimeter, or you're building it around their perimeter? Around. Uh, it's around our property line, which we share with them, so to be their perimeter as well. So the border. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. On the zoning, there certainly have been um, considerable deliberation by each council member concerning this project. We have heard from the residents and tried to work with everyone to come up with viable solutions, especially as it, as it con concerns the safety of the community. Personally, I've had numerous meetings and conversations with the area commissioners, civic association members, area residents, and the applicants. As council members, we also have to be mindful of the need for affordable housing in our community. Speci specifically, we want homeless individuals in our community to have an opportunity to secure housing and receive services that will allow them to thrive. Council has personally asked for the applicant to make changes and provide additional information concerning several of the issues that the residents voiced. Just as recently as today, we received a commitment from the applicant to provide a person trained in security to be at the bus stop, and Council, Member, Council President Hardin just addressed that issue. 
as a result of the first meeting um, I had with the Air Commission, density was lowered from 120 to 100 units, and the facility would now house men and women, and before it was only going to be just men. We checked with another issue that came, we checked on the police response times for thus for zone two in the 13th precinct and the average response time for a priority one call is about six minutes and a priority four call was 10 minutes. I've also been asked about background checks on the individuals that would be here. Now, my, now mind, be mindful of they're already coming from the, the Y, 80 of the individuals. But however, there was a concern about should these individuals have uh, an FBI check or an, and or a BCI check. So employment, so we, what we did was we employment background checks and housing and property management background check, checks have very different laws that govern them. The BCI is tailored to employment law and would not be able to provide the same information on the context of housing it's for employment. The Community Housing Network reached out to the Columbus Apartment Association and verified that the BCI and FBI checks are not used by multifamily housing industry. CHN will rely on what's called AMRAMP background checks, which fits the multifamily apartments industry standard. The background checks used by CHN include criminal records on sex offender, sex offender registries, felonies, and misdemeanors. We also understand services for residents are important. And the YMCA, which is an accredited behavioral health service provider, will offer the services for individuals living in this proposed development. The YMCA has approximately 40 service, social workers. I think we heard from Ms. Darby about their social workers. And they will have social worker, case managers, and employment coordinator also on site. Um, the YMCA staff visit with the residents. The 100% the monthly visitation means that every resident is having meaningful conversations that address their individual development plans with their case managers. And again, I think we heard from Ms. Schuler the amount of time it takes to be able to um, even begin to think about getting the, uh, the tax credits, be able to have a project like this in a community. It takes a significant amount of time and effort. And we at this city, we have a commitment to making sure that not only do we want to make sure we're taking care of the residents are currently living in communities, and that's why so much work, I don't want any, so much work's been done on this. I know there's been conversations about when CHN came out to the neighborhood, they were saying it was a done deal. And all I can say is that, you know, I wasn't at those meetings, and I'm not saying they didn't say that, and be clear with this, all I'm saying it was not a done deal, because of the amount of time that we have spent on this deal to make sure that, you know, looking at compromises because we listened to what the community said. So it was not a done deal from this body. And this body has had a number of conversations on this particular project. Something thinking, yes, no, what do we need to do? We understand that we represent not only the residents in this community, we represent all residents, homeless residents, residents that live within a neighborhood, we represent everyone. And so I don't want anyone to think that this has been taken lightly by this council. We have spent a lot of time and we will take a vote. And I appreciate where each members vote, some, you know, however they vote, that is their choice. But I want to also say thank you to them because each of them have spent considerable time. They absolutely do know where this location is. They've driven out to the location a number of times. They, we do know, we do know this, this property. And so based upon that, sure. I, um, can, can I make, this, yes, press, one, press I just wanted to, to, to thank you for this, this, your leadership through this process. Um, this is not, as, as the chair is saying right now, this is not an easy vote, um, for, for any of us, uh, 
talking to colleagues and working with Chair Tyson, uh, seven people, seven elected officials looked at this very important issue and they're are going to come down on two different sides of it. Um, when I met with, uh, so one, I applaud you for your leadership and, and, and shepherding this through and talking over and over again with the applicant, but also with the community. Also want to recognize and um, say how proud as a Southfield uh, resident, as someone who was born and raised in this neighborhood, how proud I am of Southfield. Um, you guys have shown up and you've shown out. You have exp taught, you have uh, advocated on behalf of your neighborhood, on behalf of our neighborhood, on behalf of my neighborhood, um, admirably. There is no one up here that doubts the sincerity of your concerns. There's no one on this dais that does not appreciate um, this, that uh, the true concerns that, that um, or your care for the homeless. No one is doubting that. I would also, I mean, I would hope though that as folks make the, make the decision of how they will take this difficult vote on this dais, you won't doubt our sincerity and our um, concern for the safety of young people and children. Um, it, would, it was asked, um, would we support this if your child was in or next to this type of facility, um, it, that's a personal answer for me because my six-year-old nephew, who is a, who we are raising, folks know our story, who uh, when my sister passed, is being raised on Felix Drive in this neighborhood, does go to Mary and Franklin uh, pools every, every summer. So this question is not a uh, abstract question I said the other day when I met with a group of folks that a lot of folks consider or believe that money is the most, in, most powerful thing in politics. I do not believe that. The most powerful thing in politics is fear. And when I said that it, was, it, it kept me up, the last vote kept me up at night, it wasn't that that's true. It's because I made a, a bad vote because folks were legitimately fearful. I am, it is, my, it is my, my belief, because of the commitments of uh, the applicant, because of the advocacy of the residents, um, that this will be a safe property. That is my belief. We have a housing issue in our community, in our, in our city. We have a housing issue in our city. Um, and <laughs> I see myself as much as in those folks who will be housed at a project like this as I do as, as my family who lives in Southfield. And so again, this is not an easy vote. I appreciate the deliberations that every council member has given. It has been deep, it has been long. Um, and folks, folks are listening. I, I know how upset folks are going to be with my vote. And I, I, what I promised in October when I first talked to, you, to, to the community, I would be upfront about where I was. And I would tell you how I got to where, where I am. You, I, I, I understand you won't like my vote, but I hope you will, one, appreciate how I got there and understand that I would not make a vote if I did not believe that every precaution was not being made to keep, make sure our children are safe. Thank you, Chair Tyson, for your leadership. I'm sorry, Councilmember Elizabeth Brown. Thank you, Councilmember. I, I will be brief. I just want to say that um, many of us have talked about what a hard vote this is. I think that that is because public service uh, really calls on you to make hard decisions one way or another, right? Um, and sometimes there's not an easy right or an easy wrong. And I've heard government defined as um, trying to do what government should do is the most good for the most people, especially those who need it most. And I think that's a purposely confusing phrasing because these decisions aren't always easy. Um, I really appreciate the comments of um, Zoning Chair Tyson and of um, President Hardin around 
the affordable housing needs in this city, which are enormous, um, around the tough call that we're making here at Council tonight, um, and around Councilmember Tyson's work to understand the safety concerns for all uh, folks near the property, including the daycare. And I do want to thank Starting Point for being a, a five-star, step-up-to-quality rated facility who is providing excellent care and keeping children safe every day and educated. The last thing I want to say is just a, a note on mental illness. Um, and I did not at all intend to do this here tonight, but I am in recovery from a mental illness. About 15 years ago, I was in an in-treatment, a residential treatment facility for a mental illness. And one thing I know about that is that voluntary doesn't work. Another thing I know about that, and I'm not trying to make an apples to apples um, comparison here, uh, but I do know that so often with mental illness, you are more a danger to yourself than anyone else. And I want us to remember um, uh, the humanity of most folks afflicted by some kind of disability that they really are trying to do better that they really are um, trying to heal. And sometimes it's the hardest population to serve because it's so confusing to anyone on the other side of it, even their family, but let alone strangers. Um, so I appreciate the conversation here tonight, and, and I, I will be voting yes on the project. thank everyone for their comments and again I thank the community for certainly being involved and sharing and we got to this place um, based upon having conversations with this community and there certainly has been some compromises in this and so in, in terms of or the rezoning um, of 2565 Lockbourne Road ordinance number 2228-2020 I move for passage by voice vote second Please call the row by voice. Ms. Brown? Yes. Mr. Brown? No. Mr. Dorans? No. Ms. Faber? No. Mr. Remy? Ms. Tyson? Yes. President Harden? Yes. Ordinance passed. Thank you. I now move to ordinance 2029-2020 is to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3312.25 maneuvering, 3312.29 parking space, 3312.49C minimum numbers of parking spaces required, 3333.16 fronting, 3333.23 minimum side yard permitted of the Columbus City Codes for the property located at 2565 Lockbourne Road to permit a multi-unit residential development with reduced development standards in the LAR1 limited apartment residential district. The applicant is the Community Housing Network. The proposed use is a multi-unit residential development. The C Department's recommendation is approval, and the Far South Area Commission's recommendation is uh, a disapproval. We have already had a staff presentation on this project. Um, we've heard from the um, a presentation from the applicant and the statement, and now I will call for witnesses, for witnesses, for speakers. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm at a trial with the sister. I will now ask um, people, the individuals who are for this project, Stephen Benvento, if I say, I'm saying that correctly. Stephen B-E-N Benvento, is he still here? Good evening. Please state evening. your name. I'm sorry if I didn't okay. pronounce it correctly. State your name and who you represent. Uh, good evening. My name is Stephen Benvenuto. I'm a property manager uh, working for New Horizons Housing in downtown Columbus. I was invited by Community Housing Network to speak in front of you tonight. Uh, I've lived at the Market Mall Apartments located just south of the Grant Medical Center for over nine years. Uh, CHN completed the Hawthorne Grove project that was uh, at 550 Rich Street in the late spring of 2015. Uh, they have a YouTube video with 332 views, which as of today, I don't think gives the project the justice it deserves. 
Uh, it's a 40-unit apartment building. Uh, it was given the, the go-ahead by the Historic Resources Commission in 2013, and the Downtown Commission gave their final approval. Construction began. Uh, the project sits within 300 feet of three of the properties that we as New Horizons Housing manage. Um, Community Housing Network was very engaged with the residents of the community prior to, during, and after all phases of the construction project. Questions asked by the neighbors were answered in a timely manner, and any concerns regarding the neighborhood were addressed by CHN. Uh, Ryan and his team went through great lengths to ensure that once the project was completed, that it would be a wonderful addition to the neighborhood. I would have to agree that it is. Uh, based on my experience with CHN, I'm in support of the variance for the Touchstone Field Place project. While you may, the community, be disappointed by the rezoning, I can offer you my reassurance as someone who manages the properties in the community that also did not welcome uh, them with open arms, a permanent supportive housing project. Community Housing Network will work with you every step of the way. The good neighbor agreement that we originally signed is still in force to this day, and CHN works hard to honor their commitments, especially to the communities that they, that they serve. And that's what I have to say. You're welcome. Thank you for coming down and sharing your comments in support of CHN. Um, any questions? Seeing none, thank you. Uh, my next speaker is Sheila, Sheila Eubanks. Good evening, please state your name and who you represent. Good evening, I am with Marion Franklin Civic Association. I am the chair of the trustee board. Um, we again are not in favor of the variance, but I also wanted an opportunity to say how we felt in going through this procedure. I, I, I watched you, you know, talk to a couple of people about what we have complained about that went on. I still stand by what I said. There were a lot of unfair things done by this council. We did not, I watched it from start to finish. There were some underhanded things. There were some unethical things. We just passed a, thing, a, a bill with, with incorrect information. How, how does seven people look at a file? And did anybody raise why there was conflicting stories within your file? Do the file get read? We had five people that looked at it and off the bat because the other part was the commission vote that sat on top of it. Is this the kind of work our council is doing? I loved my council, but you guys have been totally unfair tonight. That this whole thing, the faxing over of documents, the making the calls, the calling the people into a meeting, that was not the procedure. And council need to get away from that. And we all need to pay attention. We have been voting in three people at a time. We need to stop doing that. And we look at people on the merit of what they're doing for us. They got this little game running where they running them. And we let, we let them to get on a ballot. And then we vote by the ballot. We have to stop that. And I, I'm, I'm so sad. We, we followed all the rules. All we said is just look at it. We could have came up with something, yet and still. And the ones that voted no, thank you. I thank you. The next speaker is Ms. Rochelle Pat. Good evening. Good evening. Please state your name and who you represent. Hi, good evening. My name is Rochelle Pate. I am a member of the Southfield community and also on the Marion Franklin Civic Association. So, um, just first off, 
Um, I would like to say that I am um, against the variance. Um, one of the things that we talked about were parking spaces. That's one of the issues on here where CHN is requesting that pretty much they go from the requirement of having 1.5 parking spaces per uh, person to basically 0.3. So um, where are all those other cars going to park? If you've been to Southfield and that part of Lockbourne Road, you know that there is no berm, there's nowhere else, there's no street parking. The only other place that could be a parking for those residents is either in our pool area or the, resi or the um, recreation center or possibly the library across the street. So um, there's a lot of reasons why that variant should most definitely be um, denied or at least tabled. Also, um, I just want to say something about the vote. One thing that um, Councilwoman Brown, you mentioned, is having a mental health issue. I, too, have had a mental health issue. And one thing that you said was, usually, voluntary doesn't work. That's what you said. But that's what CHN is proposing, voluntary. No, that's what you said. That's what you said, and that's what was voted on. So I'm gonna just keep going until I'm finished, okay? So, CHN is proposing voluntary supportive services. I'm all for supportive services, but when you are talking about not just being next to our daycare, it's not just about our daycare. It's about being next to the pool that this location is gonna overlook it's about being next to the rec center, which is probably one of the most used rec centers in the city. It's also about being right across the street from our library. But even more important than that, it's not just about a fear factor, because I would really like for everyone here to know that we are not a bunch of fear mongers in Southfield. I'm a military veteran. I support homelessness but I also support that we could have homeless families in our neighborhood. And it is amazing to me that the president of CHN got up here and said, A, she had no idea of the police reports and the runs that we were talking about and that we have proof of here today. And number two, number two, that she also didn't think that homeless families were a priority. That's what she said. They're not a priority. I work with them every day. I work with Impact Community Action. I also have worked with the um, association for, the, for a lot of the restored citizens that are coming back. And let me tell you, a lot of those are women. A lot of them are, are in their cars sleeping. A lot of them are at Van Buren. And a lot of them are going through the same thing that men are going through with drug, opioid addiction, mental health issues as well as criminal histories because of the opioid addiction and mental health issues. So these things are real for women and children and families who are definitely experiencing homelessness in Columbus, Ohio. And there are certainly enough to fill 100 rooms for our neighborhood, which could then also feed into our high school, could feed yes. into our neighborhood. Yes? I, I'm not, I think that. You have three minutes. I, think I know that. It. I, I would. I would only. I would only just finally the say. Statement so then they can address too. Go ahead. I would also like to say that a lot of time was given to them past their three minutes. But if anyone has any questions, I'll go ahead and die. And just. I want to make sure. So the applicant, because of their responding to a lot of the questions would have more time to respond because of the different issues that come up. Mm -hmm. But all the other speakers were supposed to have three minutes, but I'll let you finish with your, your statement. Okay. What I was gonna finish saying was, why does helping the homeless have to be an either or situation? Why can't it be a situation that serves the entire community? CHN told us out of their mouths for the first two years they expect property values to decrease. That is what they told us. And then after that, they may bounce back. That was what was said at our meeting by CHN. So it's not just about fear or us not wanting to help the homeless. It's about our community as a whole, homeowners, our home values, 
our community. And I just wish that that would have been taken into consideration as well. And I do thank the ones that did vote no. And with that, I end. Thank you, and certainly um, we'll have CHN come back up and address these concerns. The next speak, or does the council have any questions for, I'm sorry, for Ms. I, I mean, I just want to yes. say for the record that I might have misspoken, but I mean, I can bore you with my story, but I can tell you for a fact what I intended to say is involuntary doesn't work like voluntary does. So we all misspeak, including plenty of the other speakers here tonight may be nervous and talking on their feet. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman Brown. The next speaker is Rolanda Hamad. Thank you. All right. Then I am going to ask um, CHN to certainly respond to s some of the issues that were brought up. Again, about your rights. I think you're writing them down. If you miss any of them, I will share those. Sure. So, so to address the actual parking variants, um, the reason that we request those variances is because very few of the people that we serve um, can afford it a car and so we just don't have the demand for parking that the parking code requires and rather than um, turn green space into asphalt that never gets used we just simply request a variance and then just to make sure that I didn't misspeak on families it's not that they're not a priority for the shelter board it's that they're um, prioritized in a different program than permits board of housing so even if we wanted to do family housing for um, homeless we we couldn't because the funding is, isn't there and then um, last uh, on property values I wasn't at every meeting but I've never heard us say that that permit support of housing would negatively impact property values and the studies that we that I've seen that we provided to the neighborhood group shows exactly the opposite that per a, a study of over 7,500 units in New York City for example showed that property values did not decrease and in fact property around permanent support of housing increased by more than property that was over a thousand feet away. A study locally in 2013 by the National Church Residents also showed that permanent support of housing has no um, destabilizing impact on the community. So, and I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. I mean, the other question was regarding the police reports. I think you've discussed that before, but again. Um, yeah. You know, I, I guess, um, from my perspective, it's not that I didn't know that we have police runs. We certainly have police runs. Um, but what I don't know is the numbers that they're showing us, how to relate that to, um, to a comparison. I would, I, would, I would say that when we look at the police runs that we took reports on for 180 of our units, it showed that our sites have no more police runs than any other apartment complex. Um, I'm, so. To the extent that uh, they think I don't know about our police runs, I do. It's just I've never seen the ones that they're talking about, and I don't know how many units, how much time, and that sort of thing. So I just can't speak to their, um, what they have for police runs. I can only speak to what we know. I just that we ask for information regarding the police runs because of this concern. And so in 2019, in terms of just your on the the south the southwest south side and far south there were um, 75 of the there were 75 police runs for those three sites there were 148 medical runs and there were um, in total for all those sites was 120 223 but of, of 480 units and that was 0.42 Correct. So, um, we, but again, because these were issues, that, comments and issues and concerns that came up, we asked for this type of information so that we would, because um, we understand the importance of safety in our neighborhoods. And this is what we have. Now, of course, you have other, you know, other units and there are other new numbers that you stated. So, but these are the ones we got from the south side. Correct. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And the other, I just want to make sure that Yes, this document that we received from the from the 
Columbus from the um, down to the Columbus Development Commission, we recognize that um, when they had the area 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 commission had approved it, we knew that they had not approved it. So we Correct. had read this document and we understood the area commission vote, the development commission vote, we recognize that. So I just want to make sure that I know Ms. Eubanks stated that we had maybe hadn't read it or hadn't seen it and we did this was a part of the file. We did have that information. Are there any questions or comments for um, Ms. Schuler? Okay. All right, thank you. We're seeing none. Uh, this is variance number, um, this is ordinance number 229-2020. And um, if there are no other comments, I would then ask for, um, for passage for this variance. By voice vote, I guess. Please call the roll by voice. Ms. Brown? Mr. Brown? No. Mr. Dorans? No. Ms. Faber? Mr. Remy, yes. Ms. Tyson, yes. President Hart. Yes, ordinance passed. Thank you. The next ordinance is 255-2020 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332.037 R2F residential district 3312.49 minimum numbers of parking spaces required 3332.05 area district lot with requirements 3332.14 R2F area district requirements 3332.18D basis of computing area 3332.19 fronting 3332.25 maximum side yards required 3332.26 minimum side yard permitted and 3332.27 rear yard of the Columbus e codes for property located at 70 north north 21st street to permit two single unit dwellings on a lot with reduced development standards in the R2F residential district. The applicant is New Heights contra Contracting. The proposed use is two single unit dwellings on one lot. The C department's recommendation is approval. The Near East Air Commission's recommendation is approval 810. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. The next ordinance is 278-2020 um, to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3363.01 in manufacturing districts 3312.21D1 landscaping and screening 3363.24CD building lines in the M manufacturing district and 3363.27B1 height and area regulations of the Columbus e codes for property located at 33 West Morrow. Avenue to permit a 46 unit building with reduced development standards in the M manufacturing and AR1 apartment residential district. The applicant is Walter Cooper Companies Incorporated. The proposed use of the multi unit residential development, the C department's recommendations approval, and the Columbus South Site Area Commission's recommendations approval 12 to 0. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Is there a second? Okay, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favorite, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. The next ordinance is 301 2020 to rezone 1010 East Long Street, being point 19 acres located on the north side of East Long Street, 73.1 feet east of Miami Avenue from R2F Residential District to AR1 Apartment Residential District. The applicant is Juliet Bullock Architect. The proposed use is a multi unit residential development. The C, de the C Department's recommendation is approval. The Near East Air Commission's recommendation is approval 10 to 0. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Doran's favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Passed. Thank you. The next one is 302-2020 to grant a variance from the provisions of sections 3332.039 R4 residential district, 3332.15 R4 area district requirements, 3332.19 fronting, 3332. 
15R4 area district requirements, 3332.19 fronting, 3332.25 maximum site yards required, and 3332.27 rear yard of Columbus e. codes for the property located at 283 Detroit Avenue to permit two single unit dwellings on one lot with reduced development standards and the R4 residential district. The applicant is Juliet Bullock, architect. The proposed use is two single unit dwellings on one lot. The C Department's recommendation is approval, and the Italian Village Commission's recommendation is approval five to zero. If there are no questions or comments, I move to amend to emergency. Thank you. Second, please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorrance, favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Thank you. Now I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, favor, Remy Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Thanks. The next ordinance is 303-2020 to grant a variance in provisions of sections 3333.18, building lines, 3333.22, maximum site yard required, and 3333.23, minimum site yard permitted. Other Columbus City codes were properly located at 1010 East Long Street to permit an apartment building with reduced development standards in the AR1 apartment residential district. The applicant is Juliet Bullock, architect. The proposed use is a six-unit apartment building and the C department's recommendation is approval. If there are no questions or comments, I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. Thank you. And the final ordinance in zoning to this evening is ordinance 3332.2019 to rezone 2571 Neal Avenue being 1.35 acres located at the northwest corner of Neal Avenue and West Hudson Street from the R2F residential district to CPD commercial plan development district. The applicant is Kelly Company's proposed use is a commercial development. The City Department's recommendation is approval and the University Air Commission's recommendation is approval 15 to 0. If there are no questions or comments, I move to amend to emergency. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Amend it. Thank you. Now I move for passage. Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Favor, Remy, Tyson, President Harden. Pass. And, and that concludes the zoning agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Seeing no further business coming before the Zoning Committee, may I have a motion to adjourn? Please call the roll. Brown, Brown, Dorans, Faber, Remy, Tyson, President Hart. Council's adjourned.